Hello, it's Mike here from the teaser, uh, continuing our series of talking about Thomas Bayes and his contribution to advanced analytics. And today I'm joined by Justin Lindsay, the teaser's CTO. Justin, you've spent the last decade in analytic centres. Can you give me an example of um, how statistical analysis techniques based on Bayes' theorem have been valuable to you? Yeah, I, I'm always surprised that, I, I, it's hard to talk about Bayes without using the ca canonical example to begin with, which may sound a little academic, but it's, it's the big difference is we can now factor in what we know about the world before something happens. Okay, so you can look at, uh, uh, the simplest example is uh, the sunset. So you have a new baby that's born, wakes up one morning, and looks and sees the sunrise and says, you know, the chance that the sun's going to go up is maybe 50-50. Maybe <laughs> but he takes a, ba a bag and he puts a white marble in because today the sun rised. Tomorrow, he does the same thing. He puts a white marble in. If it's a black marble, it means the sun didn't rise today. <laughs> so over time, if you ask, what's the probability that the sun's going to rise tomorrow, if you reach in the bag, the odds of getting a white marble get very high because the sun goes up every day. So you have to ask yourself, what does that mean? So most of, I really, uh, I, be I began my pa passion for computer systems long ago, but my passion for analytics and applied analytics, and particularly in the space of Bayes, uh, began in Washington. So I served as a CTO for the FBI, for the Department of Justice, and we spent a lot of our time trying to analyze, infer things that might happen. And many times we were in areas where we didn't have sufficient data to know what would happen, and so we could look at our view of the world historically, and then from that, we could infer things. So there are a lot, and that's essentially, the, the, to me, the big contribution of Bayes, and sometimes ex extended beyond what it should be, but the big contribution is that you can factor in uh, pre-existing knowledge about the world. You may have also heard the uh, example of the, uh, you know, the medical test. So if I tell you that, uh, you know, I have a test that's going to tell you if it's 95% accurate, whether you have this disease or not. So if you get a test and, and you take this test and it says you have the disease, um, what are the chances that you have the disease? Well, without Bayes, we would have said the chances are 95% chance you have the test. But if it just so happens that we were testing you for a disease that's one in three billion chance of occurring in the human population, then, it, there's no, then you don't have a 95% of chance. It's more likely the test was false because that big number of one in three billion dominates things. Right. So this type of uh, analysis allows us to factor in many things. So specifically uh, in Washington, I had uh, two problems. One was getting all the information together that I needed. And then once I had it, trying to infer from that things that might happen in the future. And so this meant we dealt a lot with uh, large social networks. Uh, we, we, the likelihood that uh, some connected communication channels, phones, homes, other things would be uh, would still represent the same population even if all the numbers changed and you know the likelihood that um, I'm going to receive a phone call uh, and then call 100 people immediately and then have that phone go away forever that's probably a low likelihood event for a normal person uh, someone doing something of uh, questionable uh, activities that may become a higher likelihood so right. anyway so we saw this uh, all the time, uh, and, and so it's, it's almost hard for me to think about doing statistical analysis without incorporating Bayes' uh, a fundamental philosophy. I mean, as far as the actual techniques of naive Bayes and Bayes' belief networks and things like this, we use them all the time, but for me the bigger, uh, the bigger impact was being able to factor in this other type of knowledge. So Bayes is obviously central to a lot of analytic techniques. Can you tell me a little bit about the com type of computer systems that have been traditionally used. You say you've been working in this world for 10 years. What type of computer systems are you using to do some of that work? Well, so Bayes allows you to bring in this historical knowledge to guide the likelihood of a particular event. So as soon as you word, use the word historical knowledge, the word big data should come to your mind, right? Because if I'm just going to flip a coin and say, is it going to be heads or tails, then I can have some probability estimate and be done with it. And it actually could be a very low data problem. But when you bring in the fact that all this other data could, should influence your belief about the result of that outcome, then you get into computing systems that take large, very large feeds of data. So in Washington, those would take the forms of uh, uh, terabytes or petabytes of data sets that you would then want to analyze it to create effectively 
a map of your view of the world. And sometimes these were actual things that you could represent like the Bayes belief networks where they were actually graphs and, and nodes, uh, the directed acyclic graph would be the, the term. Um, so we would have graphs, but then there are also times where it just brought to bear a huge body of knowledge. And so in addition to the, and this played very well with the analytic problem set, which is you could use the Bayes methods on the large set of knowledge beforehand, and then as events occurred, you could then um, apply those in real time to this knowledge of, of deeper analytics. And so the actual computing systems, um, very heavy, uh, data-centric, and then complemented usually with um, some kind of real-time model testing, um, and, and that, that was pretty prevalent. So in some ways, government is a special case. It can have deep pockets. It, when there is a mission, they can find the equipment they need. But at Natiza, you serve as the chief technology officer. And we're a, our, our goal really is to bring analytic capabilities to a much wider audience, including commercial organizations. So if you were to build an ideal compute infrastructure for analytic uh, computation, how would you do that? What would you be thinking about? Well, the interesting thing is you mentioned the difference between maybe government resources and an individual uh, organization. But the reality is I came to Natiza because independent of resources, uh, this problem was not being addressed like I thought it should be. So it's true that, yes, uh, some people can afford $200 million for a supercomputer and other people can't. Um, but even then, those systems are not ideally created for these type of problems. And so my uh, I showed up at Natiza and... Uh, five years ago with the purpose of trying to create uh, an analytic appliance that could address these type of problems and be a platform both for Washington as well as for individual uh, corporations. Uh, so, so to me the ideal computing environment would combine the ability uh, to store large quantities of data and allow people to easily express their algorithms of interest. So you don't really want to think about, uh, th th it's almost like a, as a statistician or someone doing statistical analysis, there's a, a set of things in the toolbox that you would expect. Today they usually do that on their desktop and there's this huge disconnect from when they go from their desktop to when they work on big data sets. So the way people work about is, is an analyst will take a small data set, they'll interact with it, they'll try and come up with some ideas, and then they'll try and propagate those to a large data set. Well, a couple things happen. One is the analysts might miss some things if they had the, could do that kind of interactive thing with the big data set. And also there's a huge gap between once they come up with their idea and deploying it to the big data sets. And so uh, we thought, wouldn't it be nice if they could do both inside of an appliance? And so uh, it was a direct response. Unfortunately, in Washington, there are, some f there are some phenomenal analytic centers in Washington, but you'll often hear them referred to as fusion centers because they spend so much of their time just getting the data together and aren't able to spend as much time as they'd like on the insights. So those thoughts made me think, well, this is a problem that's regular that we should figure out how to solve, turn it into appliance, and then allow people to use it as a platform to solve their problems. At Natiza, we have um, a history of using computer componentry, which isn't necessarily considered at the time as being enterprise mainstream. As, we, as you look forward as the CTO into the demands of analytics, do you see that there are components that are emerging um, out of R&D centers which may have value for the sort of appliance machines that you're talking about? Yeah, absolutely. I think that, uh, you know, if you look at Natiza today, we believe that this innovation has come effectively in, in two areas. One is what you might call the system level, where you combine a set of components together in a novel way targeted at a particular problem. Um, and, and that many people think of that as the, as the essence of the appliance. Um, but I think in addition, there's the compute that occurs once you have the particular problem. In the case of Natiza's traditional world, we used, thing, we used hardware acceleration. We used a thing called FPGA to bring stuff off the disk. I think now what you're seeing is more sophistication across the industry with hardware acceleration being used in different ways. So there's the FPJ, which I think will always have a great function in compression and streaming and sorting, filtering and ordering, the kind of stuff we do with it today. Then I think obviously the GPU, the graphical processing unit, has been a phenomenally successful at floating point type operations, which become very important when you're doing these kind of things on a grand scale. And the, the associated languages for allowing people to use, um, use the GPU. And then as CPUs themselves get more, uh, more cores with more memory accessible, these become I think really key tools to an analytic appliance. And I would expect that we'll see over time increased 
options in the space of hardware acceleration uh, that could be factored into the system, uh, as well as it, we can't uh, ignore the fact that the common componentry is actually much more sophisticated and can handle much more workload than it used to be. So I think we'll see innovation on, on both fronts. One, dedicated hardware for specific purposes, which should be integrated into an appliance like this, as well as the common componentry and the push on it that it will be able to handle more and more of this workload as time goes on. Excellent. Thank you, Justin. I really appreciate the time that you've given us talking about Thomas Bayes and the challenges, I guess, of building a analytic platform capable of taking full advantage of the marvellous mathematics that uh, he left us with. Great. Thanks.